Hello folks, Cyclops here, and today, if the camera decides to focus, okay, we're going to be looking, or taking a look at, oh god, I think it's the cover, it's doing something to the camera, so I'm just going to take it off, and voila, yeah, sorry about that, uh, the camera is just being, you know what, yeah, so, today we found in the Finally, gonna look at the Note 304 water cooling project that I've been doing. I'm sorry, I did. if I sound drunk, I'm not. It's just it's four in the morning, and I'm very tired. I barely get time to make these videos. So I'm not trying to make excuses, but I'm very tired. So, okay, uh, wasted 50 seconds every time already. Where were we? Yeah. So people have been asking me left and right, uh, where's your no 304 water cooling video? There are pictures, you were supposed to finish it eons ago. And I'm like, well, uh, I had to order a couple of parts. I ran into a few issues. I'll explain that along the way. But uh, yeah, apart from that, I was busy overclocking and testing the stability of the system. So uh, that I could give you all the numbers and everything all in one video so I wouldn't have to prolong it any longer, you know, your agony. So yeah, here it is. I think it looks quite nice, if I say so myself, from the top anyway. If we zoom in, uh, I'm just going to jump straight in and tell you about the loop order. And, come on, water bubble, it's fine. So this is the thump pop, uh, pump, <laughs> thump pump. Uh, pump top I ordered from Daz mode. I know I haven't mentioned it, but I I used to uh, I tried to fill the loop by using a Y Y splitter sort of thing here, and have the other end connected to one of these. It's the coolant's uh, quick disconnect. It didn't work out that well because these are very restrictive well these specific models are kind of restrictive because they're pro they're uh they're supposed to be like perfect uh no, but basically they're not supposed to spill anything when you you know undo them so they're quite restrictive anyway i'm not going to talk about them i'm just going to talk about the loop as it stands so the connector on the left is the outlet on the right is the intake so uh, to try to make the loop a simple loop as simple as possible so from pump to CPU block CPU block to GPU block and then to the primary radiator then the secondary radiator then back to the pump some of you may ask well uh, is this the correct loop order well there is no correct or incorrect loop order unless you're running, I don't know, like two CPUs and four GPUs which then water circulation would cause a problem if like it could get too warm for other component, uh, not too warm, but it would get slightly warmer for other components. In this case an efficient CPU and GPU doesn't really make a difference to loop order but you know it's politically correct so everybody say well you know the CPU blocks are so restrictive you should always go there first then to other components so yeah I did Anyway, I mean, <laughs> incidentally, it was the easiest way to go about the loop, so here it is. So yeah, pump to the CPU block, uh, so you get maximum pressure, which I guess is sort of important to some people, and then go to the GPU block, to the radiators and back end. Simple loop. I managed to use normal straight fittings throughout the whole thing, or I should say compression fittings uh, throughout the whole loop, apart from this one, this little thing uh, at the bottom of the secondary or second radiator. It's an Enzo Tech compression fitting which is uh, came very handy for a number of reasons. It's this basically. It's a uh, G1 quarter thread which is standard in the industry, industry standard. I will get my words out. And uh, you know 3 8 inner diameter and 5 8 outer diameter. Those are inches. 3 8 5 8 inches the tubing which is again standard for most of the people again th there's no right or wrong way you can choose tubing sides it's just your preferences and how much room you got to spare blah 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 so yeah the reason why it came in handy it came yeah in handy in a uh, number of or 
in a couple of ways. God, I really need some sleep, don't I? But yeah, I, I gotta get through this. So uh, these are XSPC compression fittings. I used them throughout the whole loop. I was one short, and uh, well, I decided to uh, instead of using one of the uh, well, I was one short, so I decided to use the Enzo Tech 90 degree compression fitting, and it was kind of actually necessary because if you see, this is a very it's almost a 90 degree turn and if I were to plug it straight into the radiator it would have to make like an S-shaped turn sort of thing and it would probably kink uh, the tube and cause restrictions or even uh, move this little pump uh, away or move it because the pump is it's not screwed in it comes with an ad adhesive base that you can use. I've stuck it to the top of the power supply. <laughs> you know, this is like the perfect place for it. It doesn't move a lot, but you know, obviously you can unstuck it if you really have to. But yeah, that 90 degree f uh, fitting saved my bacon. And yeah, so uh, I wanted to break the power supply cables, and I'm glad I didn't because there really isn't room for all that extra bulk. Because you know, when you break them, uh, it takes a lot more space and I didn't really have a whole lot I mean I managed to fit uh, most of the extra cables from the power supply underneath the power supply because there's a gap for it since the power supply used if you guys remember from the first video is a SFX form factor which is smaller than ATX so it gave me extra room uh, underneath it so yeah well I guess it doesn't look all that great but I mean, I can't really complain. There's nothing, I mean, nothing you can do with, uh, I mean, I use the short cable kit too, but it looks like a bit of a mess, but you know, overall I'm satisfied. Uh, I try to make it uh, look the, as, uh, look as uh, best as I could, but you know, there you are. The extra cables from the I.O. Uh, panel, you know, the USB 3 reset button, well, there's no reset button, the power button, the LEDs, and so forth, they're all uh, tucked in under the front panel, which, that that I'm glad there was a whole lot of room, uh, that, that there was a whole lot of room behind the front panel, you could, uh, I've, I've actually seen people stick SSDs uh, in that space, which is pretty smart, that didn't occur to me, but, you know, uh, I stuck mine, Actually, I have two. Well, one SSD and one mechanical hard drive, both two and a half inch. But I stuck mine, if you guys can see, to the sides of the power supply. The SSD is on the left, and the hard drive, which is really difficult to see, on the right. So that's about this side. And the other side is, is uh, yeah, I think it looks, it looks okay. I mean, the... Since the power supply was smaller than ATX, obviously it wouldn't fit in the frame, so... Uh, Silverstone made a smart move by including an adapter. And that adapter is not painted in black, and it's just unpainted steel, so it looks a... Ooh! Camera tripod. So it looks a bit out of place, but, you know, what can you do? I mean, I could have painted it, but it doesn't really matter when you close the side panels. So, uh, there's a whole bunch of cables, I try to deal with them as best as possible. Hit, uh, hit uh, the cables for these two intake uh, fans uh, over here, and the other two exhausts over here. I mean, there's not a whole lot I can do at this point. But consider this like the back of your case, like where cable management happens. That, uh, you don't... You never really get to see, so I guess it's okay. This blue cable is kind of out of place. It's the signal cable for the pump. I, I routed it to the motherboard, used it on the CPU fan header. I wanted to monitor the pump RPM and everything, and you know, I set it up in the way that it's, it's going to tell me when the pump fails, if the pump fails. So, yeah. Uh, well, another thing that saved my bacon, well, we're going to look at the back for a second is this little thing right here. Ooh, where is it? Oh, there. Is it, uh, it's a adjustable fan controller. You got three position, very low, medium, and high. I think it's seven, nine, and 12 volts. Not exactly sure. Uh, that was great. It really helped a lot because uh, 
I uh, connected the all the fans in the system that are on the radiators, total of five. This is just a camera. There we go. Uh, ooh. A little bit to the yeah. There we go. Come on. Tripod's really flimsy. Ordered it from Amazon, twenty bucks. What do you expect? So yeah, uh, the fans. Uh, I use Noctua's extensions and Y splitters to connect everything to the fan control. Obviously, the fan control only has three channels, and I have five fans. So I coupled these two, uh, coupled these two, and then coupled both of them together. Uh, actually, I didn't. I coupled these two and coupled these two and extended each of the channels to one of the channels on the fan controller and the other one with the, the 120 millimeter fan, which as you guys saw was orange. It's a Cougar fan. Cougar fan. Yeah, it's a Cougar uh, Vortex fan, I think. A PWM 800 to 1500 RPM. It's a solid fan if you use it in a vertical position. If you use it horizontally, like at the top exhaust or bottom intake, it's gonna make a very ugly, annoying wind, uh, noise. It's it's got to do with the bearing. I think I explained it before, but yeah. The front fans, incidentally, are uh, not Cougar. They're from Cooler Master, and they're called Blade Masters. These are the 92 millimeter fans, and they're rated for something to 2600 RPM. They're PWM. Not that it matters because uh, the fan control obviously doesn't recognize signal and doesn't even have any pins for it. Even if it did, it wouldn't make a difference because it's a fan controller and there's no signal going through it. Just ground and power. And what else can I ramble about? Yeah, uh, so yeah. Oh, these two to one channel, these to another channel, and the last fan to another channel. Again, all of them, you don't have a choice but run all of them at the exact same speed as the other ones, so doesn't make a whole lot of difference. I just thought it'd be nicer to split them into three channels and occupy all three. Now the main view. I already explained the loop, so uh, maybe I should go over the components at this point. A uh, couple of cool things about the case. It does have a bottom mounted uh, power supply uh, cover, not cover, a uh, fan filter. So, you know, that's it's a nice feature to have. You know, don't get dust all over your power supply. And also has right in front of this panel. I mean, you can see the reviews of the case. I'm not going to review the case, but uh, there is a dual dust filter for the two 92 millimeter fans at front of the case, which worked very well. I mean, when I was overclocking and stress testing, I had the fan control switch all the way to the top or maximum, so it actually collected a lot of dust and kept the system relatively clean. Uh, I, I should mention that I uh, leak tested the system and <laughs> overclocked it at the same time. And when I, I've used compression fittings like since forever and never had any leaks with them. They're very safe. I mean, barbs, uh, barb fittings are just as safe if you use them properly. But just something about compression fittings, they look really nice and clean. So I've never had any problem with it. Again, I had I kept my eyes on it for like at least 12 hours. Had uh, Paper towel, everybody just did like this, you know, the usual stuff. You guys, you water cooling guys, you know what I'm talking about. And that's about the basics. Now, the reason why it took so long, one of the reasons, because as I explained, I was using the quick disconnect to, you know, fill the system and it didn't really work out well. Not enough. It was a lot, it was restrictive a lot. So, this thing saved my bacon, as, I've, as a lot of things I've mentioned did. A lot of things saves bacon these days. This is the, uh, I forgot the brand, I think it's, the brand is Watercool. And Dasmo sells them, the Canadian retailer, I think I've said that before, I'm, I'm, I'm just running out of energy. But I shall keep on! I mean, go on, do something, yeah, maybe have a seizure, but no. Okay, so I think uh, it's time for me to go over the parts, I mean, I, I kind of went over them. The first time around, but again, did change a couple of things. Uh, let's see. Oh, we're already in 15 minutes. I think I explained about the straight fitting, so uh, yeah, yeah, I did. Okay, so the parts. And pardon me if I 
sound distant, but uh, I am looking in a box, just uh, dishing out all the boxes of the parts I've used. So, storage, primary storage, 60, oh, 64, <laughs> 256 gigabyte Samsung 840 Pro. Excellent choice, if I do say so myself. Loads Windows in less than eight seconds, uh, ten seconds, eight seconds, something like that, from a cold boot. So I mean, who, who needs Windows Seven? Uh, Windows Eight, and I do have Windows Eight on an Ultimate on Windows 64. But uh, that's the, that's the primary storage for games and operating system. Mechanical storage. I have uh, HGST, or formerly known as uh, Hitachi. It's a one terabyte. They're a part of Seagate now, I believe. Uh, so, uh, yeah, mm, one terabyte, 7200 RPM, 32 megabyte of cache, you know, standard. One terabyte storage in a two and a half millimeter form factor is kind of neat because I stuck the uh, both of the storage uh, components to the sides of the power supply as I showed you. Or did I? Yeah, I think I did. Forgetting everything. Yeah, so the SSD to the left and the hard drive to the right. The kind of you could, really can't see them. Uh, they're just been completely blocked, but they're there. Trust me. So that's for storage. The processor, you know, I just decided to use something proven. I mean, what else? And i5 3570K overclocked, obviously. I will go over the details in a bit, but I'm just going over the part right now. So, what else do we have here? Power supply, motherboard. Okay, so the power supply. Silverstone SFX series, and it's the ST45SF-G. It's again, it's the F SFX. Uh, sorry, SF, yeah, SFX form factor power supply, which is much smaller than ATX. 450 watt. You might be shouting, why would you use 450 watt with the system like that? And the graphic card is a GTX. 670 trust me more than enough under like a uh, massive load I'm talking like 3d mark 11 and our crisis 3 like, doesn't even go up to 350 watts it uses around 350 and that's overclocked so even this is kind of overkill yeah you guys uh, I've seen I've seen somebody in the forums that uses uh, not gonna name any names they use uh, they have a it's an Intel i3 with a GTX 460 SE and they're using a uh, Corsair 1200 watt power supply, the AX series. Like, I mean, are you insane? Probably. But I guess the guy just doesn't know that you don't need to overkill the power supply portion of the belt. The motherboard, Asus, obviously, P8Z77i Deluxe. It's not the wide wireless display edition. Not needed. So, uh... It's a very solid motherboard. It's just the BIOS is so easy to use. Just, Asus makes the best. Just, uh, I mean, they got the biggest market share when it comes to desktop motherboard enthusiast class, and th th not everybody knows that they make probably the best motherboards. And uh, enough rambling of that. What else we got? That's about the main components. Oh, forgot this little bad boy got a EVGA GTX 670 reference card, 2 gigabyte. Nothing special, but you know, extremely power efficient and the main reason I chose it was because it's very short. Didn't interfere with the cables or the radiator, which I'm, I'm glad I did. I mean, I probably could have used something a, a, a bit bigger, longer, but chances are it probably wasn't and isn't are going to be a water block for it. So. 670 was a no-brainer. The main fan I talked about, Cougar Vortex, PWM. A decent fan if you use it horizontally, if you use it vertically, you know, the bearing is horrible, so don't. So I'm using it horizontally here, no issues. Just, just be careful of that. Fans, I explain again. Uh, I'm gonna explain again. Blade Masters 92. Ooh, 800 to 20. To 2800, that's a massive range. Yeah, they do move a ton of air and make a hell of a lot of noise when they're turned to maximum, which is quite nice if you're deaf. If you're not, and uh, I mean, the 
fan controller. Fix care of that. Those are the main parts. Oh, the memory, don't have a box for it. It's the, you know, Samsung Wonder memory. 30 nanometer, it's 8 gigs in there, 2 times 4 gigabytes. Pretty standard for gaming rigs. I could have gone with 16 gigabytes, but just not needed. Not needed for gaming systems. Water cooling components. These two are identical when it comes to looks, but one of them, can't tell which, was the water block and the other one was the back plate. So yes, I am using a uh, water block and a back plate from XSPC. The back plate is actually functional and cools the uh, memory chips, video memory chips at the back of the board. It's quite nice, by board I mean graphic card PCB. No, I'm not dead. I'm just uh, digging out the box. The secondary radiator, or the second one, it's a thin, kind of, well, slim. Magical 120 a slim radiator. Slim. Yeah, uh, working quite well. You know, most radiators are kind of the same. I mean, not exactly, but this is what I had available. It wouldn't have made much difference to get something exotic. This one, the Black Ice GTX Gen 2 Extreme Micro 184. So, this is the main radiator I'm using. Got a lot of cooling potential, this thing. It's amazing, especially with those fans, they move a ton of air. This unmarked box, which did not contain any manual, is the box for the pump top slash reservoir. It's a DDC pump top from uh, Watercool. I think that's the fourth time I've mentioned that. But yeah, it's only about 60 millimeter uh, in height, which is excellent, considering that I was kind of <sighs> constrained in terms of space. Uh, yeah, 60 millimeter is like 2.3 inches, in case you guys are not familiar with the metric system. It does kind of block uh, one of the fan exhaust outlets, but it doesn't. It doesn't make that much of a difference, really. The, the air moves freely just as fine. Finally, the underrated XSPC, or not Race Storm, it's the RASA, R-A-S-A, -A, water block, or RASA, whatever you want to call it. It's a very cheap water block, and it's incredibly, uh, it's, it's very good, it's very good. Uh, people are gonna argue, you know, it's very restrictive block, which doesn't really matter in a loop as small as this or even bigger loops. It is restrictive, but the performance is excellent. I mean, it can like match the performance of blocks that are twice as cost twice as much. I would have preferably, preferably, if I can get my words out, I would have liked to use a race storm, but I didn't have it available at the time and didn't want to spend like 50, 60 bucks extra, so just use what I had. And it's working beautifully. That's about it, I think. And the pump, which the box is missing for some reason, is a uh, Swiftec MPC or MCP 355, which is a DDC pump. Very small, noisy, one running at full blast, but uh, not much I can do about it. I was using, I was going to use a D5, uh, the 655 pump, just not enough space. Just no space, so I ended up using that. And I actually had it just in. I, ha I bought this the, the pump like three years ago, and I'm glad I had it or kept it because it, it worked great. Apart from that, the pump is a little bit loose. That's because it's being stuck to the power supply with a uh, with the sticky tape that came with the pump. It's not screwed in. It's just the, no way I, I was gonna. Screw it to the power supply. So I just stuck it in. It's 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 in pretty nicely. And yeah, I think that about covers all the main components. Yep, that's it. Uh, the video is not gonna end here. I am going to cut this part short because the memory is full on the camera. So I'm just gonna put the files in the computer. And come back and go over the overclocks and some of other features that I think I need to talk about before wrapping the whole thing up. So, see you guys in a second. Okay guys, I just decided to show you the case in action before we go over the 
overclocks and whatnot. And uh, yeah, the camera's not picking up the light that great. And ignore, please ignore the mess around. It's just this kind of my workspace. So yeah, I used the included blue LED strip that came with the graphic card water block. I think it looks quite nice. If I move closer, you can hear the pump. It's a little bit loud, but I mean, it's a DDC pump, so what do you expect? Uh, I wish I could turn it down a little bit. I can't. So the fan control is set to lowest possible setting. Now we're going to move it up to the middle just for a little sound test. Not much when you go from 7 to 9 volts. And now for full blast. <laughs> Loud, isn't it? Uh, I uh, used the maximum settings for when I was uh, testing the overclock for stability testing. For general usage, I've tried like playing the games or something. Temperature go about 5 to 10 degrees higher, but it's uh, incredibly quiet, apart from the pump. So yeah, that's about it. I think the blue looks really nice. And there's also the blue LED, the power button up front. That looks really good as well. And now we're going to go over the blah 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 overclocks. And mind you, I'm getting a lot of bleed from the... Okay, let me just adjust the camera. I'll be back in a minute. Okay, folks, as you can see... I mean, you can pretty much see what the system specs are. 3570K. 4.6 gigahertz. 1.41 volts. Now, I should mention before we do anything, I forgot to include this little thing. It's the Cool Laboratory Liquid Pro Thermal Paste, which is the best thing to use if you decide to delid your Ivy Bridge processors. Now, Haswell is coming out in a couple of months. I hope Intel addresses this massive issue and uses proper solder stuff or a decent temp to bring the temperatures down but yeah as you can see uh, I managed to get 4.6 gigahertz out of this processor it's not a particularly good CPU or chip because it requires 1.41 volts I've seen other chips do the same frequency at uh, 1.2 volts but what can I do it's a silicon lottery and this is what I got. I was going for 4.7 at 1.47 volts but I wasn't uh, completely I wouldn't uh, know, like, I, I wasn't sure if the chip was gonna last a long time if I gave it that much voltage so you know uh, 100 megahertz less not gonna matter much uh, you know, performance-wise, and it's gonna uh, the CPU's longevity is not gonna be affected that much with 1.4 volts, especially when it's cooled this well. Now the memory, I told you guys, it's the Samsung. I should move the tap to the center so you guys can don't have to look all the way to the corner of the screen. The memory is the Samsung, which uh, I think I explained in the first video. It runs at 1600 megahertz with 11, 11, 11, 35 timings. I've managed to overclock it to 2200 megahertz with 10, 10, 11, 16 with 1.6 volts. And that's pretty amazing. I mean, it's a really cheap memory. I think I bought them for 40 bucks. They overclock extremely well. And by the way, this setting is 100% stable. I've tested the stability of the processor and the memory by running Prime95 large FFT for 26 hours and the uh, uh, blend test with 90% memory usage for 34 hours so you know about 70 hours or 60 hours worth of stress testing everything was rock solid no errors whatsoever didn't have any crashes and any benchmarks so the system's rock solid stable and that's pretty much the I, I uh, if you guys remember my uh, Landrig video you know, the uh, NZXT or NZXT Vulcan. Uh, I use the exact same memory kit, but in that I managed to get the timings to 9, 10, 11, 14. So that kit is, that kit is slightly faster and more responsive, but in all honesty, it's not going to matter uh, 
real world applications or even any games whatsoever. Um, I'm still pleased. R really good memory kit. You know, very similar timings and voltages to the other kits, so that's pretty good. Motherboard, obviously, the PHZ77i Deluxe. And yeah, let's. I actually haven't checked the SPDs for these. So yeah, hmm. To rate these at these speeds and you know <laughs> no that's what I got and uh, I'm happy with it so that's the CPU the GPU that uh, doesn't really say much there I have overclocked it I mean it's a reference board GTX 670 so even with water cooling there's not much uh, you can get out of it. I mean, I'm, uh, no more than the usual. I managed to push it to 1202 megahertz and 6600 megahertz on the memory. So 1202 on the core, which is the decent, uh, decent clocks. I actually get exact same speeds with my SLI 680 setup in my main rig. So uh, I was hoping for a little bit more, and that's with maximum voltage, but obviously 1.12. Sorry, 1.21 volts, which is uh, the hard limit for the board. If you guys know much about these graphic cards, they come with 1.175 volts out of the factory, and you have to uh, enable 1.21 volts by uh, modifying the graphic card BIOS, which I did. And that's um, I, I, that uh, extra voltage got me about 25, 30 megahertz. Again, it's water cooled and all that voltage just not gonna. Shortened life. I mean, my 680 has been running for almost a year now, and no sign of degradation whatsoever. Doesn't mean it's going to be like that forever, but you know, Nvidia themselves just are say 1.175 volts, nothing more than that. I say, well, I'm going to take another step forward. I'm an overclocker after all. I am, um, after all, I like to take risks, even though they're extremely marginal and uh, well thought of. Or, uh, I can't even speak. You, you can see the clocks, right? Uh, clock, right? There, over there. 420. Come on. 420 in the morning. I have my excuse. But I will try to get my words out as clearly as possible. The temperatures. Uh, so, after 36 hours of stress testing with the uh, blend, the highest temperatures on the core I saw it was the second core. It got up to 72 degrees on the Prime 95, which is you know superb for 1.4 volts remember guys you don't tell somebody oh I managed to get my processor to 5 gigahertz and I'm getting this much temperature that's completely completely irrelevant because the voltage is the main thing that affects the uh, temperatures not the clocks when I could run this chip at 3 gigahertz I'd still get exactly the same Volt, uh, temperatures because the voltage didn't change so it's all that just keep that in mind I mean most of you guys know just a reminder uh, yeah so I mean quick stress test prime 95 you guys are blind and it's blinking I know now I want to focus okay focus yep I'm just gonna put large FFT for a minute or two temperature gonna climb up to 70 degrees and kinda just stabilize over there I mean I have the fans at the uh, lowest setting, so as soon as I turn them up, temperatures will drop much more. So yeah, that's about it. Uh, yeah, the reason why I'm getting low temperatures, as I've explained, is the thermal paste, the cool laboratory liquid pro, which works superbly. Uh, what other? What else? What else? Uh, left the integrated GPU clock at 11:50 default. Actually, I left it at 1250 because uh, just for a quick overclock, it's not going to make a difference whatsoever. But you know, the 1250 is pretty stable for default voltages. The HD 4000, God of Thunder, nah. Yeah, so graphic card uh, temperatures, mm, maximum temperatures after running Unigen Valley 1.0 for 18 hours. Maximum frequencies and voltages was 47 degrees, which is outstanding, really. Not outstanding, but it's quite great. It's it's excellent, really. Uh, for a small little water cool loop. So I think I've talked about everything 
uh, that's relevant. Give me a couple more minutes, I'll start talking about my ferrets and then my love life and then the Jupiter and the Zeus and okay, I'm just, yeah. So that's about it. I hope you guys enjoyed this as much as I did because uh, I still don't know what I'm gonna do with the rig. I might sell it. Or I might. Uh, uh, Put it somewhere I can use because I already got my land ring and my main rig, this third one. I just had to build one because I haven't had uh, built a proper rig in a couple of months and I was getting that overclockers builders itch. But I just had to make something happen. The Note 304 is like the all perfect chassis. I, I love that. I, I, I'd like to uh, make another build in it, but the uh, Maybe slightly more powerful graphic card, maybe a 680, or maybe even a GTX Titan. You never know. But I don't have the money for that. I just built this, so I might uh, probably gonna end up selling it. But yeah, that, that like you know when the journey's at its end, it's not so much fun. It's all about the journey, the what you do, you know, during the whole thing, the challenges you endeavor. And I'm rambling. So I'm going to end the videos here, end the video here. Uh, thank you guys for watching, and uh, I'll hope to see you guys soon. If I got another custom build, I'll put it up. And meanwhile, enjoy the Formula 1 and Grand Turismo 5 videos. And other random garbage you just put on from time to time. Thanks, guys! Okay, okay, one last thing. Just uh, wanted to do a couple of Cinebench runs, or just one. It's, it's my most... It's it's my favorite CPU benchmark program just because you got two different modes of operation, one single core and one all cores. This supports up to 64 cores or threads, whatever you want to put it or said. And uh, it's great. So it's uh, it's excellent for comparative comparative results because you know it does a single threaded application benchmark sort of thing and it also does uses one core and then uses all the cores. Uh that Took me so much energy just to say that. I'm gonna say it correctly. Uh, yeah. Uh, so I just ran it. I'm running it for the second time. Should get about 7.7, 7.6 sort of thing, which is, you know, standard. Uh, 4.6 gigahertz, 3570K. 7.72. Which incidentally is exactly the same, if you guys can see at the left side. Let me just zoom in. Yeah. I have a ton of Cinebench results. I compare like I've, I've compared anything from socket 478 Celerons to the dual core, the dual CPU hexacore Xeon. So, got an extensive database. So, yeah, so it's exact, pretty much exactly the same as the core i5 2500K, the previous generation i5. So that's the sort of uh, Thing I'm getting with Ivy Bridge, exactly the same performance as a Sandy Bridge, but uh, using you know 200 megahertz less. It's the same scenario with every single um, CPU I've tested. So 3770K, 4.8 gigahertz, gets exactly the same score as the 2700K, 5 gigahertz. So yeah, it's about 20, 200 megahertz more efficient. The Ivy Bridge. One last thing. Perhaps a little bit more important and fun and quick error than what I just did. Uh, I'm just going to restart the system to see how quickly it reboots. Thanks to that Samsung SSD, which I found it to be pretty amazing. So, three, two, one, let's go. I hope you guys are timing it. I love the mother bo uh, motherboard's uh, boot menu. Just extremely simple, extremely fast. Doesn't load anything that's not necessary at the start. So there you go. Windows load, and we should be in. <laughs> it's just like I said in the early part of the video. Why do you need Windows 8 when you got an 840 Pro? <sighs> Windows 8 is crap anyway. Okay, so before it starts to uh, hurt my eyes and uh, with uh, the focus issues. Ooh, let's see. Um, I'm gonna cut it now. So, see you guys later. Bow. Okay, 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 okay. One last thing. Yeah, so I found the pumps uh, box. MCP355. I was right. Goodbye.